Hello! I hope we're doing everything all right. We are live, I suppose. So, hi everybody. Hi. I'm John Bopicelli. I'm a, an editor at Wired UK and I'm here to... Uh, have been usually a force for good. They have been crucial to enhance the human condition, but they've also been often accompanied and coupled with some kind of strong uh, mistrust and distrust among the general public. And this, is, this has been constant, uh, but it is very apparent today. Uh, so there are still, uh, there's still a lot of mistrust around technologies such as 5G, with uh, people thinking that it's linked to COVID, for instance, uh, or AI, uh, I can think of uh, an episode especially in the UK as soon as it was known that uh, the government was using AI to confront the COVID pandemic. In some regards, there was an outrage, a backlash. Uh, or oh, IoT, VR, all these new emerging technologies are often um, linked to some kind of mistrust and conspiracy theories uh, in some sections. It's, I think it's a minority, but it's a sizable chunk of the society. Uh, at the same time, though, I think the pandemic over the last year has just exposed how uh, useful and, uh, in some cases, fundamental uh, leveraging technology in a smart way can be. Uh, so I guess whether there is a conversation to be had about how to make sure, on the one hand, that we, I mean, we, the tech, the tech industry and the people of goodwill, if you wish, gain back the trust of the general public at large in the power of science and technology. And on the other hand, there's a discussion to be had about how actually make sure that technology is used for good. So after this very long premise, I will introduce our uh, star-studded uh, panel, starting with Gal Amit, president of New Real Design. Then New there is... Yeah. Hi, hi. Yeah. New Real. <laughs> New Deal is... Uh, <laughs> that's very bad. New <laughs> Real Design. Yeah. Uh, uh, Jan Beranek, CEO at U+. Plus. Good, Isabel, good to be here, guys. Isabel, oh, nice to meet you. See you actually, I met you already. Uh, Isabel Nussli, chairperson at Responsible Leadership. Uh, she joins for with Switzerland. Hi, everyone. William, hi, and uh, William R. Palaya, the founder yes. together. Hi, William, how's it going? Hello, uh, welcome, thank we you. We should be, <laughs> thank you very much. So we should be joined also by Jashri Sek from 3M, but she's not here yet. Hopefully she will join us as this proceeds. Uh, I'll probably start with, Isabel, so does technology have, does the technology industry and the technology sector have a trust problem and why and that, how do we confront it? So when you, when you see we use GPS, we use Netflix, Spotify, and we check the forecasts. At the same time, we worry about uh, excessive monitoring, about uh, AI biases, about data privacy, which means we blindly trust and we strongly distrust. And then we ask the question whether tech is good or bad. And this is a, a question that immediately addresses the level of emotion, quite a challenging starting point for a constructive um, debate. So technology amplifies human behavior, the good, the bad, and the ugly. So it's about how we shape it because technology and machines are, um, are intertwined, but it always starts and ends with people. The discussion itself is like, a, like a, a spicy stew. So it's a complex mix of ingredients spiced up with emotion, meaning logic and rational meets uh, effective and um, emotional. But fact is that we have trust boosters and trust eaters. So yes, technology has changed the world uh, for the good of humanity predominantly, and it continues to do so. But how do we ensure that these transformations are for the better? Which brings me to the trust eaters. Um, mistrust is rooted in fear, and there are different types of fear that need to be mitigated in order for trust to flourish. And some are related to the technology itself, such as AI failure. Others are related to the people behind or surrounding the technology, such as fear of, of misuse 
or job loss. So the last um, comment is it's, it's a call for leadership, for responsible leadership, um, but also for, for a collective effort in going about. Right. Well, uh, I, I'm curious about solutions uh, in terms of uh, w- what's the best way of confronting that? Do, do we have to have regulation to kind of, I don't know, change the way tech companies behave? Do we have to just have a massive uh, I don't know, edu- awareness campaign? What, what do you think would be the best ways of confronting those problems you um, I I think what we need is a, a smart regulatory framework um, to deal with issues or dilemmas related to these to the wider ESD goals, so ethics, social, and um, diversity. Call it the corporate governance of of new technologies, because that that's um, something that ensures benefits, that um, speaks to the majority, but that does not um, discriminate. But the corporate governance, that system is not a magic tool by itself, so it needs to be lifted which brings us back to human being. And it requires a collaborative effort across fields. Just briefly on these um, types of fear and how they can be mitigated. Um, so fear of AI failure, algorithm, they have outperformed humans um, in all domains when it comes to um, forecasting or in almost all domains. But errors are much more pronounced in the rare case um, that they occur. I mean, think about a a surgery, a critical surgery or self-driving car. So beliefs about the technology and about the people, the processes surrounding the technologies are key. When we come to the solution, it's about familiarity, it's about objectivity, and it's about past experience that help increase trust and use. With regards to misuse, I'm talking about topics such as discrimination, Mm -hmm. control, accountability, and here we need to address questions such as how to instill morality, how to, is there a universally accepted ethical system? What what values do we, whose values do we we use? Who's responsible? Who's liable? Um, Et cetera. And so all these calls for government regulation um, and and tech... Yes, and, and tech and, but, <laughs> of course, but tech and, and work are global and jurisdictions in general are national or regional. And that's why I say it needs a uh, collective Isma. effort. Okay, yeah, sorry, uh, Will was sort of flipping uh, in and out of my screen. But that's actually a very good point to raise because, of course, regulation is important. But one thing I think I, I'd like to pick upon that you said and maybe bounce it to Gaddy. Uh, I think that trust, in a way, if I if I understand correctly, can in some case be linked to transparency, awareness, telling people how the start the process you described work, right? So people trust what they understand, and I wonder whether there is a sort of role for uh, regulation on the one hand, but also design within uh, tech companies in order to enhance trust. Yeah, what what's your take as a as an expert in this subject? Yeah, I think. Um... I mean, I've been uh, spending the last 30 years uh, in rooms with people who would lead uh, eventually some of them at really large companies and so on. And I, I think there is a, a general uh, misunderstanding and a lack of awareness of societal impacts of uh, the technology that they are developing. Uh, usually the pattern has been that... Um, you start with uh, a technology gadget or a software that is supposed to be s- kind of small and then grow gradually. Uh, but in reality, sometimes it explodes and become overnight success. And you are not capable or haven't thought through all the societal impacts of uh, that uh, invention, if you wish. Mm. So uh, I, I think that um, there is a need to really inject a lot more uh, societal uh, awareness and, and thinking through the process of developing the technology. And that will require uh, a major shift in the mindset and the makeup of these uh, product development teams and uh, getting people that are coming more with a uh, humanities background people maybe like myself with the arts in the background and a variety of other inputs that are not common in our current system that is based on STEM education and very narrow uh, excellence in 
uh, math, physics, programming, and so on and so forth. And, and that really, uh, when you look at the overall product performance uh, or the software performance, uh, makes a difference. If you do have people mm. who are involved with other uh, aspects of uh, human uh, intelligence, um, you know, the, the example I usually bring to mind is that uh, the late uh, Stephen Jobs wasn't a, a STEM person. Uh, I think the only uh, academic education was a calligraphy at, um, uh, at a very liberal uh, college here in, in the Northwest. So I, I really think that there is something to be said and to be done on the makeup of uh, the teams who make those decisions, mm. who make these uh, break, uh, breakthroughs. Can, can regulation play a role there? Because you're describing something within a company culture, right? Uh, well, this well, has a more sort of regulation perspective. How do the two things interplay there? You know, I, I would, I would uh, argue that this is uh, probably less of a regulation issue, even though I'm not opposing uh, regulation at some levels. But I do think that there was awareness uh, growing and still uh, put into action of, for instance, uh, getting more women into those teams that develop. So this is the same type of uh, diversity push. And it's not a diversity of gender or racial makeup, makeup or whatever. It is diversity of philosophies that is la lacking currently in, in, the, in those teams. Right. I see that actually Jayshree has theoretically joined, um, I can't see that. So Jayshree, talk to someone at Horaces. I, I, will, I will send an email to Anyway, uh, yeah, uh, I, I'd like to uh, get William's perspective on this because of course, as an entrepreneur, he has been doing uh, tech for public good uh, in a way okay. himself. And so maybe he has a kind, some kind of recipe about the process and the way they think about how to gain the trust of the possible sure. users of the technology, whether it's a question of uh, company culture, whether it's a question of abiding by regulation, whether it's a question of both, whether it's a question of just doing the right thing, the way Google used to say, it's not the motto anymore. What do you think? Well, well I mean, I agree with all that. I mean, it, it, as far as, you know, what's been done in the past, you know, tech for public good, you know, do well by doing good, you know, that those types of uh, slogans, you know, it, they've worked for a long time. I just, technology is very mature at this point. Um, you know, when I started, you know, boy, I don't want to say, but I mean, pre-internet, but, uh, you know, technology has been around for a very long time. Uh, the government uses technology and has licenses in the United States, uh, you know, with, with, you know, accounts that are running over 20 years now. And, um, and the technology is pretty old because, you know, there's really no competition. Um, I think in the big picture in dealing with enterprise tech and especially from development. And then I got into sales, you know, I think in order to be able to move forward, I think some of our mature technology, maybe we need to find a new use for it possibly even giving it away to the people, um, you know, because in a way, enterprise tech is also people. You know, when you think of, uh, like, with Together, you know, I'm basically aggregating technology that already exists, just putting it into the hands of the homeless with a, a free smartphone, uh, you know, and access to the Internet. Uh, but really, everything that's going in there has already been made. Um, and... I think some people believe that when they need help, especially from the government, that it's almost like they're having to go through a maze intentionally um, to kind of slow the process down. Um, and I think people have different ideas of why, maybe because the systems uh, aren't developed enough to be able to handle you know, current needs and are like rushing to try to, to get there. Um, but I mean, just seeing people here every day in the state of Minnesota, um, mm. you know, there's a lot of trust to be built up. Um, we're fortunate here in the Twin Cities that our tech communities meet often. Um, we're always looking and reevaluating to try to be more inclusive. You know, I know we have a lot of we don't have communication set up with everyone because in order to do that, you have to kind of align everyone's interests 
And I think when people feel like they're just being like driven along and that they don't have a seat at the table or even feel like they have a stake or like a share in the outcome, yeah, there's, there's no place to build trust there. You know, you have to, you know, look at them in the eye, so to speak, and say, hey, you know, I I'm listening to you. You know, what are your concerns? You know, let's talk about it. And, and how can I take what you've given me and, and be able to make, you know, uh, things better? And the nice thing is, is technology is there now. We look at us talking right now. Look at all these apps that are popping up here and there. You know, we can talk to each other, but the issue is, is that we need to be able to align our communication because it's always thought of that, you know, people are for the people and tech is really thinking about the bottom line. They're thinking about, uh, you know, expansion, uh, you know, dominating supply chains and, and stuff like that. But the people are getting more and more involved in sustainability in their daily lives. And I think that is, that's being heard. And I think now that technology is at a place where it is now, um, I think trust will be built uh, through the technology that is coming right now. You know, right. It's inclusive. Yeah. Okay, that's, that's, that's a fair one. Uh, I'm curious possibly about John's perspective now. Uh, so, how, how, in, in your like, data, I think you're mute. Uh, in, in, your, in your company, U, how do you think about building ventures that are for public good? How do you go about it? Uh, when it comes to your side of the operation. Right. If I can follow up on what Isabel and Gary was saying, I think, uh, I, th I think it is, it's a bit of everything. It's the regulation and it's the makeup of the teams. And the most impressed I have been with, um, a person that I've been with, um, uh, most impressed was a, a student at Berkeley who studied a combination of machine learning, biology and humanities. Uh, mm. uh, oh. which I thought was, was a lot of free time, a lot of, a lot of time on his or her hands. Uh, well, the, the thing was, it was, uh, it's, it's apparently one, uh, it's a, apparently one major, right? So, oh, so oh, I think wow. that's, a, that's, oh. an, that's an amazing oh, wow. combination of things that, that, that yeah, right. Uh, it should prepare people for, uh, for the kind of technologies that we're talking about. Right. Uh, but, but just to pitch in, I think it's a rate of innovation uh, discussion as well. This rate of innovation has been increasing rapidly. Uh, and as it's been increasing, the, the age of U.S. senators has been increasing as well. Uh, and wow. the, the rate of misunderstanding of what the technology does currently and what it has, you know, could do two, two years ago and what it can do in two years. There's a there's a big gap that's uh, has developed and is still developing, right? So I think for can you give a sense of what that brings? Uh, because it seems very interesting this uh, interdisciplinarity point, which I keep hearing, uh, but sometimes I struggle to understand why that's so important. I totally agree, sort of instincting level, but I'd like to get examples in which that changes right. the game we're playing. Right. So I think I think there 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 are a couple, um, and it's and it's the secondary effects or, or the negative externalities that you can that you can take a look at what um, you know technologies like Facebook uh, ultimately bring. Uh, there is an army of content moderators that all uh, at Google and Facebook and all of these that um, that are really getting PTSD and need mental health support because of the stuff that they they see every single day that the people that then go on a platform don't see. And it's a secondary effect that has a very real impact on maybe a small number of people in comparison with uh, the, the number of people that actually use the technology, but it's there. Then the whole discussion about freedom of reach versus freedom of speech. Speech? Right? Yeah. That, are, that are being conflated. Sorry, what? Yeah, it's very catchy. I, mean, I keep hearing yeah, that. Yeah. That's actually very good. Well, we, uh, you know, and, and we all agree, we all agree on freedom of speech, I think, uh, but I'm not sure if everybody agrees on freedom of reach. But the way the algorithms are, are written, the, the freedom of reach is sort of given, right? And that, that creates, that very quickly brings people with the same opinions to the same place and then amplifies uh, what they're saying, which might not be the best thing with some groups, right? Uh, and that's yeah. also, and, and what I'm saying is also a controversial statement. Right. So I think you need you need a diverse mix of people in these companies to understand that this could happen because it's already happened. Right. Uh, and you need a, a, 
I, w- I don't want to say smarter because it doesn't mean anything in this in this mm. sense. Uh, so, let's say smarter regulatory framework, right? But done by people who understand the technology a little bit, the fundamentals fundamentals of the technology, uh, so that um, so it's up up to date or at least not thirty years behind. You know, the whole two thirty discussion in the U.S. Uh, now it's 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 a thirty year old law that hasn't been updated, and what has internet looked like or what, 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 what was internet three 30 years ago and what it is now. All right, so I, right. Just wanted to follow, I just wanted to follow up on, on the previous. No, that's, 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 that's absolutely fascinating. Uh, w- w- one thing I would ask you, uh, all of you actually, but I'll probably start with you since you, I, I have you in my clutches. Uh, hmm. How do you think the pandemic changes it? Because in a way it showed us that technology can be leveraged for good. I mean, there are some questions about whether contact tracing apps are secure, whether they can be used to control you, but we can also possibly agree, at least in principle, that these kind of tools can be used to fight the pandemic. But on the other hand, the same period in which we have seen this, uh, these things emerge is also a period in which everybody thought that Bill Gates was infecting them with microchips, right? So you, as soon as you have to find a culprit, you go for the tech CEO. Um, what's your everybody's view about how the pandemic changes this kind of discourse about trust and mistrust and technology's importance and technology threat. Uh, Jan, if you want to, to go first, we can go like... Uh, sure. <laughs> around the, yeah, the yeah I, I think... The I, I think yeah, I think it aggravates it further. Uh, and it's a bit of a, a, a bit of a broken, broken window argument, right? Because the window is broken, the, the person who repairs the windows, uh, gets the jobs, right? But the, but the, but the loss, loss of property or, or the damage isn't counted in, in it, right? So yes, we What's have. What's the window in this metaphor? Uh, uh, well, uh, the window in, the, in this metaphor is being able to go about your daily life and do your job, right? Okay. So now we have now we have Zoom or Clubhouse or things like that that suddenly rose and everybody's talking about that. But at one point there were 22 million Americans who didn't have a job, right? Um, and like it's being put on the sort of the same level, right? Which is not true. Um, so I don't think anything anything significantly changed in in the fundamental uh, root of the causes. But now you have people who uh, there are a significant number of people who lost their job, while you know billionaires get uh, uh, more money in their pockets, and there are apps that help with certain aspects that were super successful, and it's not a balanced discussion. Um, so, right. so I don't I don't think anything really changed other than there there's more spotlight on it, which is good. Isabel, do you agree? Do you think that the pandemic will? Uh, be essentially uh, neutral in the balance of the trust versus mistrust debate. Yeah, actually, I, I fully agree. I even think that COVID has accentuated uh, previously existing perceptions. So those that have believed in science before have remained strong advocates. And those that did not believe for whatever reason, uh, in general, experts tend to not um, believe in or less believe in, in algorithms uh, than others. So I think those um, have, you know, have remained um, less strong advocates. And the ones in between somehow got polarized a pulled to one of each end. So balance-wise, yes, but maybe more accentuated, more emotionally loaded, which is not always good news because then we discuss um, a certain topic on, on the fact level and on the emotional level. So it's really hard to, to find, uh, uh, to make compromise or have a healthy debate. So I think that has changed a bit how we approach the topic. But at the end of the day, um, in terms of trust and mistrust, I don't think all that much has changed. Is the pandemic the right time to carry out the kind of regulation bombardment uh, that some people uh, wish for? Because it has exposed how important some companies and some technologies are to it, governments and the state's survival, right? Even more than usual. It's a good question. When do we move or change? You know, usually when there's a pressure point or pain point. Um, look at innovation. So I think in a way, yes, as, as sad as it sounds, it, but it, it really has helped um, trigger 
um, or helped us move. But I think, again, it's not just about regulation. That's the point I wanted to um, make beforehand. It's also about the organizations, what uh, Gadi um, referred to. By the end of the day, it's, 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 it's about people. It's about us. It starts with ourselves. You know, awareness of whom public, who's the public, um, it starts with, with ourselves. But uh, again, um, we, people are stuck in their stomachs and in their hearts and not in their minds. So often we try to tell why something makes sense or needs to be done. But then we forget that there's a lot of fear underneath and we need to meet them where they are. And transition is always slower than change, just to incorporate that there's an external part, which is about the whole strategy and the structure and regulation. But then there's an internal part, especially within organizations, that speaks to the more of a psychological realignment among employees that's needed for change to be successful. Gali, I saw you were nodding uh, with a sort of self-satisfied air. Can you elaborate on the nod? <laughs> You know, I, I want to actually maybe uh, suggest a slightly more positive view of where we are. I think uh, generally uh, this is one of the most uniting moments in the last uh, um, decade in terms of understanding that we are all uh, in some kind of an intertwined social system, that if your, uh, uh, you know, uh, supply chain on the food side is not functioning because people are getting sick, Uh, you won't have food and so on. So as we haven't had such, such an example of a, uh, of a system or a societal system in a long time where people understood that they really need to pull together. At the same time, I want to be very cautious. Uh, my view of overall uh, bureaucracy performance through the uh, pandemic is actually quite poor. I think uh, there is something to be learned from the success of uh, Zoom and other uh, uh, technology companies that somehow... Um, Not uh, Skype. Not what, Skype. Yeah, well... Uh, <laughs> did you name? Just a random <laughs> deal, Skype. See, <laughs> generally, I want to say that actually uh, the disaggregated uh, uh, nature of technology and technology companies, that they are just there in the ecosystem... Uh, some of them succeeded, some of them less, uh, proved to be maybe a better way than a centralized bureaucracy that, uh, as far as I've seen uh, throughout the world, uh, really, except in totalitarian areas, uh, really didn't, didn't perform well. Uh, mm. and, and that's something to, to be learned. I think there's something uh, uh, the technology business wanted all the time to uh, bring to the front, that there is some ecosystem that uh, provides a lot of opportunity for a lot of technologies to compete for the best uh, utilization, if you wish, or utilitarian values. And to some degree, the pandemic proved it's right. You know, uh, so I just want to put that a uh, uh, little uh, more positive view on, on, uh, here about the pandemic. At the same time, we obviously have a lot of societal uh, 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 problems coming from the pandemic, uh, unemployment. Uh, uh, I want to say something again, talking about STEM versus not STEM. Mm. You like to look at the numbers. There are a lot of people who are just grieving. This is a, a very uh, strong psychological backdrop that we tend to dis uh, disregard. They're uh, grieving for loved ones. They're grieving for a career that was... Uh, um, uh, um, uh, they're grieving for businesses that are lost. They're grieving for a cityscape that has changed. And I just want to change the, the story here a little bit. These are not 22 million or 7.8% uh, additional unemployment and so on and so forth. The numbers are there. I also want to bring it into a more uh, human story of people that their lives really changed and, 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 and really for the worst through, through those uh, uh, months and so on. So no, it makes absolute sense. Uh, and it also makes sense to that you underline the societal uh, disruption because uh, we have seen a lot of uh, that also uh, of people, of course, spending time online. And we have seen some of the end game of too much uh, grief plus uh, a lot of time spent alone, jobless, in front of a screen. We have seen one possible endgame on January the 6th, I suppose. Um, I, I'd like to, I mean, I think it behooves me to 
uh, talk to Jeshri Seth from 3M, who has finally joined us. Jeshri, you, you missed the first part of our conversation. I'm sorry to... Uh, I'm so sorry. I don't know. I was not able to get on. Oh, that's so bad. Uh, but you're here now. I, I, hope, I hope you follow the initial part. Uh, we have been essentially talking about mistrust in, in technology uh, in general and how that's been changing during the pandem pandemic. And I remember that um, before the, the, the talk, a couple of weeks ago, we had a chat and you explained me that actually, even if there is a lot of talk about the tech clash and conspiracy theories that seem to entail that uh, technology and science are dangerous or uh, malicious, uh, actually the trust level in the general population are pretty high. Can, can you give us a sense of this? Are we debating a very small sliver of distrust? Yes, yeah, so we do the survey called the 3M Data Science Index, and we have done it since 2017. And we saw that skepticism for science was going up and trust was going down. But for the first time when we actually did it during the pandemic, and this is a global survey developed in developing countries all together, what we found is that for the first time since we started doing this survey, skepticism actually went down and trust in science and scientists went up. Right. So we think that as a result of the pandemic and the fact that science was center stage, scientists were considered believable and people realized that science is the only thing that will allow us to get out of this pandemic because we were all facing the same existential threat, virtually all of humanity facing the same crisis. And we saw sort of the gift of science, the vaccine, which we all await now. The interesting piece in all of this is that science of health sort of gives us an inroads into health of science. Because mm -hmm. when it's about health, it becomes personal. And somehow people are more interested in it. So the way to talk about science and technology and the narrative that we build has to be very focused on the human context. And that is exactly what we have learned through this pandemic. So if the narrative is a value narrative as it relates to human beings and humanities, I think that's when we have the opportunity to build that trust uh, and, you know, move away from this sort of fight and flight that people may perceive or the defensive attitude when we start seeing things. So it's really played out well. Um, and we also find three, three results that you'll find interesting is one, people say, oh, yeah, we really need science and technology to get us out of these situations. We really need more people pursuing STEM careers. And we've all seen like sort of the Fauci effect and other things that are happening when people see that you actually can help people. And interestingly, people have not said that sustainability challenges are are somewhere in the background because during the pandemic, they saw the dolphins come back and the Himalayas visible again and all those things. People are realizing, wait, science can help us with that also. So we also think that it's a win-win because right, right. we know that underrepresented minorities and women are always more motivated with the pro-social goals so we can address the STEM equity issue as well. I just have a question on what you just said, which is uh, like heartening in a way, but What were the drivers of mistrust beforehand? Do you have any intelligence regarding why people didn't trust science uh, well, before the uh, pandemic? That means I have to share with you the one statistic that still makes my hair <laughs> rise. So the first year we did the survey, we said if science didn't exist, four out of 10, four out of 10 people said if science didn't exist, their lives would be no different. <laughs> exactly. 30% of the people call themselves science skeptics. And in this population, 60% said if science didn't exist, their lives would be no different. So the problem is the following. Science is invisible. Science is underappreciated. Science is taken for granted. And I can say this with full confidence because guess what they took their survey on? Aha, their laptops and mobile phones. <laughs> So they love the technology that they have in their hands, but they don't realize the amazing material science and other things that have gone into affording them all these benefits. So part of this, to answer your question, is the whole idea that unless people know that science is related, it's not related. 
So we as a community of scientists and technologists and data scientists, we have to make sure that we portray science in, in the public light and say how it facilitates all these things that you are so enjoying. So part of the skepticism comes from the fact that people are like, well, um, no, I don't believe in it. And that's easily said because they don't realize that everything that they're doing and every time they look around themselves, science is all around them. Sorry, we can't. I can't hear you. I don't know if others can. Yeah, there's the same to be. Uh, no, I can I hear can't you. Either. <laughs> Still, Still can't hear you. We can't hear you. No, you probably need to switch the source of the audio now after you remove your headphones. Good point. Yeah, Bluetooth. You would you would think people would figure it out, right? Sure. Yeah. Uh, I mean, and it never works. Mm -hmm. Yep. No, I think it's so, um, the whole idea of STEM needs this huge influx of the humanities to make it such that people can understand it. And we are learning every day because in a community of scientists and technologists and science savvy people, you never realize how little people have been brought along with us. And, and that's why I think that science communication And that becomes just a central part to this. And I think in the pandemic, we saw that happening. Can't, still can't hear you. <laughs> can't hear you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Jaytree, and so, so what do you, what, what is a tangible change that you think uh, we'll see when there, I don't know, when you, if, if, we, if we had a scientific experiment and if we have a team of five STEM people and we introduce one humanities uh, person, yeah. what, do you, what do you think, what is a tangible thing that will, I think the biggest thing is science is driving for answers. I think the humanities can help us synthesize the questions that we need to ask. Because we think about this a lot. I think having those together. In fact, I can give you my spiel, the real shtick is stem. Science, <laughs> humanities, technology, engineering, and math. I like that. Uh. <laughs> That's how we have to start thinking about everything because it doesn't exist in sort of silos like this if we don't have that interconnectedness. Mm -hmm. uh, because four things become very clear to us as a result of this uh, 20, uh, 20 results we got during the pandemic. So, John, I'm just going to describe those results because I know you're still struggling. No, we can't hear you yet. So I'm just going to go through the, the four results. I say it's time to stem skepticism, and I will invite people to co comment on what I'm saying. First is the science of health for health of science. Second is what I call the technology and sociology of trust. We have all been very worried about the misinformation and the disinformation that comes on all these different means, the way people are engaging through social media and such. But in our survey, what we found is that people still trust science-based organization and scientists way above social media. So it's, this trust is a very fluid concept and it's very personal. And it's nice to know that still science and science-based companies and science-based organizations were rated much higher. Third is E, I say, is for making and And, and, and sort of seeing that whole diversity in it. And finally, what the public said is the math of accountability. And it basically means the additive power of the entire stakeholder spectrum. People, experts, all of them combining together. So I say it's time to stem skepticism by combining all, all four. I just want to join and I... I, I I started the discussion with uh, stating something very similar to what you've said about the need for humanities and other uh, contributions to come in. Uh, and yet I want to make sure that this is not becoming like a token uh, humanities person in a room uh, full of STEM people that is uh, just uh, checking the box. I think the real issue is in guiding technology and Uh, creating a holistic value out of few technologies, you need uh, enough of the decision-making to be done and to be guided by people that are not STEM-oriented. I think to some degree the humanities have more of a connecting tissue effect 
than the verticals of different STEM expertise. And this is something that I want to put on the table here that maybe the horizontal thinking is more akin to uh, a non-STEM while the more vertical uh, is, 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 is STEM-like. Sure. So right. just uh, something here. Yep. Come back. coming from other countries over the past couple of years. So in the UK, for instance, we are going to totally phase out technology produced in China uh, for 5G, so from Huawei specifically. Um, how is that going to change our whole conversation? Is that going to be a sort of splintering of trust? So you're only going to trust uh, the uh, technology, always going to check that a certain kind of technology has been made in the US or in the UK or in France or whatever. Uh, how good or how bad is that for the conversation we're having now? Uh, we have four minutes, so I suppose that we should probably have a very quick comment from each of you. Will, do you want to start? You have like 30 seconds to give me your take on that. Um, I, it, it, technology is here. Technology drives us. You know, um, the reason why we invented the wheel is so that, you know, we could pull more with us. Um, I think with technology, it's always going to be a, a small group of people that control it and move it forward and uh, so that everyone else can, you know, uh, take advantage of it. But, um, you know, through the pandemic, you know, people have been pretty isolated and they've gone onto social media in order to be able to connect. Um, the issue has been that it's a curated experience that they get, you know, mm. through, you know, the various media outlets. Um, but I just, you know, I, I would never underestimate the power of compassion and about people caring mm. and, and people are caring more now, gosh, than I've ever seen in the tech community. Uh, and so I'm, I'm mm. optimistic. I think, I think we're going to be better for this. Supply chains are going to be stronger Good. and it, we're going to be better. Wonderful. Uh, John, do you want to interject? I, I, Sorry, uh, unmute. T takes time. Yeah, no. So, no, no. Yeah, um, <laughs> I, I I agree uh, with uh, with Bill uh, on the Huawei. Um, I don't think it's a technology discussion, uh, really. Mm -hmm. uh, in in, the, in that example, I think it's a political discussion, and I'm not. Right, I'm not. That, that, I'm not going qualified. To impact, it's going to impact on trust, right? So the same way. People no, of course, talk it's about going to impact on trust. Vaccines from certain countries as opposed to other countries. It might be a sort of impact, a ripple effect on the way we talk about technology. Maybe rightly. Uh, Isabel, what do you think? Yeah, actually, I was just going to say the exact same thing, that I don't think it's a technology question, but it's a question about politics. But again, by the end of the day, it, it's about um, all of us. So it all comes down to, to, to people. Again, I keep repeating myself. And um, that's when we, um, this diversity discussion we had at the beginning comes in, but with diversity comes inclusion. So it's not enough just to have diversity on all levels, but to make sure that we also... Um, understand each other and speaking the same language, yep. STEM, not some humanity, not but just that we um, uh, manage to align and, and degree the understanding and then we can really have a healthy discussion because it needs a collaborative effort. Okay. Uh, I'm optimistic. Yeah, mm -hmm. you just said yeah. One minute, so. yeah I, I'm not going to agree with Huawei is a different story, but I do think that there is a lot of, uh, uh, I'd say, um, uh, Western arrogance towards uh, non-Western uh, uh, excellence. And one example that related to the pandemic is the Sputnik V, the Russian uh, vaccine. Mm -hmm. Apparently, is a very good vaccine that is being poo-pooed all over the American media because it's not American or all that. So I think we need to be a little cautious about what we are being fed by uh, the, the media here in the U.S. or the politicians. There's a lot of excellence outside the West and we need to be able to be uh, less arrogant and accept it and, and, and collaborate with it. Yeah, I think it comes down to sort of a Venn diagram is what I'm hearing between government and science and people. And if you double click on it, it is not just policy, there's the politics. It's not just the practitioners, but their proficiency. 
And it's not just the public, it's the perceptions. So if we bring it all together, I think we've got it. Well said. Nice. John? Yeah. <laughs> 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 yeah the, um... So much trust in us. <laughs> oh, my God. I could not get in. So what, when did, do, were you all able to just get in? It said your um, something is locked or something like that, and it wouldn't get let me get in, and I kept trying, and it was just annoying. Mm. The, there was something with the permission related to your official name on this platform. I know yesterday I had some issues oh. like that. Oh. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. Terrible. So I'm going to take a picture, and we're going to miss right. John. Yeah, I think we are uh, just about done. Oh, uh-huh. yeah. hello again. Yeah. I missed that. <laughs>